Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome back. I'm Paula and today I'm going to talk about some technologies that are currently being developed to detect um, oceans in other planets and what do I think should be done for the future and what is being done. Um, so first of all, why detecting oceans? Um, there are already a lot of things out there, whether it be rovers and helicopters on Mars and hopefully soon on Venus. Um, and there are a lot of telescopes out there to study not only our solar system, but also things outside our solar system, for example, exoplanets and their atmospheres. However, um, very rarely these telescopes, so we call it remote sensing, is used to study the surface. Yes, there was a successful detection of Enchilado's ocean with Cassini in 2010, um, as it was mentioned in a talk before. Uh, however, it was never successful to the point to detect oceans on uh, other planets outside the uh, solar system. So this could be quite interesting to develop. Um, but why do I keep talking about oceans? Why not detecting a continent or just something else? <laughs> um, well, first of all, oceans are biosignatures for life as we know it. Of course, there could be something else as mentioned in many talks before. Um, but for what we know, this this could be a valid biosignature, but also uh, oceans have a particular optical uh, properties that uh, would allow us to detect them, such as um, light scattering and so on. So why do I talk about optical properties? Basically, the way remote sensing works is that we receive some light from objects in the sky, in this case, planets, and uh, um, their spectrum, we call it the light that we receive at different wavelengths, can uh, tell us different things, whether it be informations of molecules in their atmosphere, or uh, perhaps, hopefully, surface. So uh, the spectrum is divided, let's say, in two big um, parts. There's the thermal part of the spectrum, and that, as I said, uh, usually indicates um, molecules within the atmosphere. Um, and for example, this could be methane as, as previously presented by Ilan in a previous talk. Um, however, uh, as I mentioned, for the ocean, we need more optical properties that we would be able to detect uh, within the visible optical or UV part of the spectrum. So this would be the reflected starlight part of the spectrum. So th the light is given by the interaction of the host star and the planet, and the planet is reflecting of the light and that way we would detect it. So as I mentioned, there aren't um, concrete technologies already. We are still at a point of elaborating the technology and running numerical simulations and building models. But this would be an ideal uh, geometry setup of a, a technology to detect such uh, oceans. Uh, so it would be using orbital longitude. Orbital longitude is defined such as that at uh, zero degrees, the planet is in between um, the parent star, the host star, and the observer. In this case, it would have to be a satellite because we need something away from Earth, out in space, enabled to study, uh, to be able to study uh, exoplanets and other planets. Um, so yes, the, the orbital longitude is defined as such as zero degrees, it's in between such objects, and at 180 degrees, it's in full phase, it's called. So it's, um, it's behind the parent star. Uh, this being said, then, um, running simulations, so um, with different scenarios, let's say a planet having an ocean, a planet not having an ocean, a planet having an ocean and some clouds and so on. Uh, it was able, we were, well, uh, it was possible to uh, create this sort of map, let's say it's a graph um, based on the polarization. So at 74 degrees, 
um, the water of the ocean uh, is at maximum polarization of light. And it would be in that exact uh, angle that we would be able to detect um, um, the ocean thanks to light scattering. Um, so this, there is a lot going on in this graph. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to uh, go over everything. But in general, if there were, um, for example, an ideal planet, Earth size with an ocean and hopefully no clouds uh, to, let's say, um, create some um, difficulties in the detection of the planet, it would be represented by the gray, the gray line. So the data points as I highlighted with a circle in um, yellow. Um, there is a problem because um, these points are overlapping with other, other data points. And these are uh, represented by the, the black and red line. These represent dark surfaces. So no, no water whatsoever. And the point is, if we were ever, uh, able to detect a planet that we think might have an ocean because let's say in this graph it would fit along that line along the gray line it could at the same time be a false positive because it could also actually not have an ocean so this is a bit a gap in the technology uh, moving over this is not the only uh, method being developed there are uh, many others and another that i took for example for for this talk is um studying the earth itself we we know that the earth has uh, an ocean uh, has many oceans um so we can use it to develop the technology itself and let's see what can we detect through such technologies um so um yes mapping the, the Earth at different, um, with different throughput, we call it. So um, any kind of um, um, obstacle, let's say, in the, in the detection, this would be clouds, hazes, um, aerosols, dust, um, that would worsen the detection. In fact, we can see the first image uh, on the left is uh, um, only has a precision, a photometric precision, so just the precision of the detection of 3.5. 4.3 percent and the, this means that it wasn't able to detect much because of the quantity of um things let's say in the middle um within the atmosphere so clouds and so on as i mentioned um however if there was a throughput of 10 percent the precision increased to 10 percent of precision. So the difference in the graphs is that there is a little bit more colors in every slice, let's say, of the maps representing the world. And the more the color, uh, the more the surface was detected. So for every slice colored, it was able to detect that piece of earth or ocean. Um, and finally, the third one was a bit the most successful, let's say, um, as it was able to detect a bit more, uh, as we can see, 42%, with a difference within the telescope uh, diameter, so six meters, and still a throughput of 10%. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, this could be an alternative method so to um, develop this technology while uh, studying Earth. However, we still don't know the impact that could uh, that um, dust hazes and clouds could have in the atmospheres. Um, so why detecting? Uh, oceans, well, once we detected oceans, what, what do we do with them? Well, there are different applications that um, many fields could um, benefit from. For example, oceanographies and study how ocean form, whether it's in another planet, but hopefully finding solutions uh, to questions we have for our own planet. Um, 
and geophysics uh, questions too, and also lead to uh, maybe more accurate formations of theories of planet formations, elaboration of theory, um, but also exoplanet formation. But also um, maybe it would help us identify better habitable zones. Maybe we detect a planet bearing ocean outside the habitable zone or around a host star that we thought wouldn't be um, hosting a habitable environment. And all in all, just astrobiology, maybe we find a different type of uh, biology that isn't what we thought. And we, we talked about this in previous talks. It came out already in previous talks. So just uh, what could we do in the future to improve these methods? Because as I highlighted, there is still so so much to do. Well, first of all, um, better cloud models. First of all, um, we need to improve cloud models for atmospheres. We still don't know the impact that clouds have in detections of atmospheres, whether it be exoplanets or uh, planets uh, far away in the solar system. Um, and once we improve those, it will certainly benefit uh, surface detections uh, for sure. And so uh, this would be um, possible also through uh, space-based um, telescopes with high contrast imaging. Um, and also another thing that could improve, um, uh, could be improved in these technologies is also research of habitability assessment, as I mentioned uh, in the slide before, and in particular of direct image and the transiting planet. All in all, um, just as many things in astrobiology, the key, I think, is interdisciplinary research. So connecting different fields, different topics, especially something like studying oceans, but in other planets involves different sciences, whether it be oceanography and exoplanet science and atmospheric science and so, so many more sciences. So this was my talk. Um, uh, thank you for listening. And I will end sharing. No? Oh. Well, thanks so much, Paola. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? You can ask in the chat or unmute yourselves and ask a question if you like. I see Sanjoy has his hand up. Hi, Paula. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. I was curious about the uh, effects of resolution on detecting oceans. Presumably, when you we detect an exoplanet using telescopes that are nearby Earth, those exoplanets will be like one or two pixels, you know, and that's it. Is that yeah. enough to detect the glints that you're that you're describing? No, it's not. <laughs> that's why we haven't been able yet to to detect anything have we um the the models that i've shown are only um numerical simulations um yes we are we we hope with james webb hopefully being launched soon to maybe have more information and being able at that point to develop such technology but we we know that james webb is going there to to beyond other things also study uh, atmospheres but the point is first it, we need to perfection the the detections of atmosphere before detecting surfaces but there's nothing wrong to also carry on obviously the development of such technology so that we're ready once we have such data to carry on i think that that would be my answer 